Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore a relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. We have Stephanie Rose Bird back on the show. It's going to be a great episode. We're talking about her book, The Healing Tree, and we talk about a lot of wonderful trees that are magical, spiritual, and medicinal. And before we get into that, I just want to share a couple announcements. The first one is that we are having the Plant Cunning Conference in person at our small farm in central New York uh, this summer, the last weekend of July. Tickets are available. You can get those at plantcunningconference.com. We have some wonderful speakers, including Seven Song, Zamboni Funk, Lisa Fazio, Rebecca Beyer, and Pam Montgomery, who is actually offering a wonderful event this Saturday. So make sure to check it out. It's Saturday, April 6th at noon. This year's keynote speaker at the Plant Cutting Conference, Pam Montgomery, is offering a free live webinar, Plants Help Us Live to Our Full Potential. In the webinar... You will hear Pam's insights into how plants and nature can help us to adapt and thrive in a swiftly changing time. She will cover how plants' evolution is linked to our own, how plants know exactly what we need to heal, and how plants can help raise consciousness. This is a sort of preview to what Pam is offering in an eight-month online program called Co-Creative Partnership with Nature. AC works with Pam on this course, running tech support and live community meetups for each cohort. It's a very interesting and robust program that teaches tangible skills for communication and working with nature. Students join from around the world, so you get to meet some interesting people as well when you join. So again, the first is a free online webinar this Saturday, April 6th at noon. And the eight-month program enrollment is open until May 5th. You can learn more at wakeuptonature.com or use the link in our show notes. And then the last thing is uh, that, as usual, I am still offering donation-based Vedic astrology readings. So hit me up at info at plantcutting.com if you would like to schedule one of those. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Okay, so today on the Plant Cunning Podcast, we have Stephanie Rose Bird. Stephanie is an artist, a magician, a an hoodoo, a green witch, author, teacher. She's fantastic. <laughs> we interviewed her first on our episode 19, which was one of our first episodes a long time ago. And since you've written several books, including this new The Healing Tree, which has just come out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Stephanie, how are you today? And how have you been over the last I'm few great. years? I'm great. I'm doing very well. Thank you. It's uh, an interesting time with the climate, you know, and it's it's already spring here and it's really not supposed to be. But mm-hmm. the trees are bare and yet some flowers are coming up. It's all very odd. <laughs> and I'm just observing and, you know, always being connected. And I'm a little concerned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is. Everyone it does feel weird. Like, oh, this is great. And I'm like, is it? <laughs> yeah, it is a little concerning. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely been the warmest winter up here. I mean, it used to be you know negative twenty five, mm-hmm. and we didn't even get exactly. below zero. <laughs> yeah, this year. Yeah, us either. We had we had one. We had three cold days this winter, and they were really cold. But other than that, it's just been spring. And so, you're in the Chicago area, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's usually so cold here. People, you know, snowbird and they do all kinds of things to get out of it. And now there's, you don't even have to take a shovel out. So, mm. yeah. 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 First, the first winter we were here, because I'm from Western Pennsylvania and this is a little bit colder. There yeah. was, you know, four feet of snow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, christmas eve and it didn't didn't melt the whole winter so how have the last few years been for you what have you been up to i've been so busy i've been you know i have a really big encyclic herbal guide coming out called motherland herbal awesome yeah i've been working on that it comes out june 11th from harper one and i also am starting a it's called earthwise spirituality and it's an apprenticeship with me for six six months um and so i'm developing that program and 
Um, I've been doing illustrations like in the Motherland Herbal. I have, I think, over 50 illustrations in there. And they're very spiritual and mystical. Oh. And I was just so delighted that they were happy to publish them and large too. They're not like mm-hmm. tiny little things. They're like whole pages. Awesome. And pages. And so, yeah, just a mixture of art, scholarly planning and writing. Mm-hmm. Wow. And that's a great combination of all of those. You know, you get to have yeah. the, the art, the writing and the plants all together. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. I feel really blessed actually to have this path because it is everything that I was on this path since I was a child, but I didn't really realize it. So I had to try dance and then theater, poetry. You know, it's been like a progression to to get where I am now, but always focused around plants and herbs and things like that, the environment. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that's wonderful that you you know feel like you're it's you're coming into your own fully now really to to it's really nice it's mm. it's really unimaginable because I'm always <laughs> a, I'm like a Virgo and I'm, so I'm a perfectionist and I'm always like worried about things and you know but things happen the universe listens and observes and assists and it's really beautiful so yeah, and magic works and herbs yeah. work and oh yes. Healing yourself and healing your community is, yeah. gets makes it makes things better and better. And that that Virgo energy probably comes in handy when you're writing and editing lots of books. It does. <laughs> yeah. It does, but at other times it's like, oh, you really like cramping my style here a little bit. <laughs> I know. I'm a Capricorn and I feel like oh. I can relate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think of Capricorns as being really tenacious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Work yeah. goats. Work goats. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I actually yeah. wrote in Virgo Witch, Evo Dominguez wrote a whole series of for the sun signs, and he picked the different ones of us that were born on and different signs to write a piece. That was pretty Ooh, cool. fun. Yeah, it's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, it, as I've been studying Vedic astrology more in depth, and it's different. Uses a different zodiac, uses sidereal, and so in that I'm like a a Gemini sun, and all these other things. But it's allowing me to see sun signs in a new way too, from the tropical perspective, because like I'm still a Cancer tropical sun, and I can yeah. still see like the liking to cook and nurture and those kind of things. Yeah. And, it's it's like even more potent in a way, seeing it from another perspective. That's mm-hmm. gonna be interesting. So that you brought that up because I am about to embark on a Vedic study. Oh, oh wow. It's amazing. I that whole the whole tradition there is is just so I mean, like it's unbroken. Yeah. And they're still doing fire ceremonies from thousands of years ago, you mm-hmm. know. Like it's cool. it's um it's an amazing, powerful tradition yeah. there. Well, thanks for that affirmation for that, because, yeah, mm-hmm. still in the thinking stages, but I think it's right for me to to pursue that path. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, cool. Yeah. Exciting. So the, the book is The Healing Tree. Yes. It's beautiful. And yeah, beautiful book um, on all about trees. So why did you write this book? What, what, what do you what love about trees? Well, they changed my life. No, I was living in East Orange, New Jersey, which is pretty close to New York, till I was about seven, I think. And then we moved to the country and to South Jersey, a little outcrop of the South Pine Barrens. And they became my friends. Like there were no, there were no sidewalks. I had really, it wasn't like a neighborhood. It was like, I would call it more of an area because we were so dispersed but I was surrounded by trees and they quickly became a focus of mine that carried me through my youth. And it's, they're just really important to me. Like when you were talking about ash borer, I was thinking about, you know, right now the sun is kind of blaring in my face as you all can see, I should actually, I'm going to make a little bit more shade, but our shade tree our elm that was in front of us, we, we had to be 
taken down also for infestation, the whole neighborhood. Like we had all of these really old ancient elm trees and they were taken down one by one. And Mm. when ours had to go, I got really upset about it. I got, I became really emotional. I had a dialogue with the, I guess they're arborists, you know, and said, don't make me pull a Luna on you because I will, I will do something, you know, and they were like, no, we don't want to do it either, but it really has to be done because they're a danger to to everyone. So yeah, they're just, I don't know, just like historically to my people, personally to me for this planet, they're just Mm -hmm. like hugely important. So I had written about herbs quite a lot specifically and green magic and then I thought well how about just to focus on one type of um, growth which is very important to all of us and I decided on the trees it used to be another book called the healing grove in 29 or 2010 it came out and I don't know, it was a bit of a, it, it just, it wasn't the right time for it, but it is the right time now. So I'm really grateful that it was um, reinvigorated by Wiser Books and now we have it. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Get a hold so of this, this comes out of an earlier project. It, it was, it was a different book. It, I mean, it was the same book, but it's been kind of renewed repackaged it has fresh illustrations that are not mine but beautiful love the cover mm-hmm. I wrote a new preface for it Louisa Tesh wrote beautiful passage mm-hmm. in there for mm-hmm. the forward so it's something old that's new again wonderful yeah yeah, mm-hmm. yeah and it's been wonderful to get to know all these trees because there are so many trees in here and it's, yeah. it's research too Mm -hmm. Um, and there are temperate trees tropical trees Mm -hmm. some trees that i know well and some trees that i have never heard of before (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. Um, each one like i remember you know i talked about my elm here but we had an elm that i grew up with that mm -hmm. i used to go and lay in her arms do my homework kind of hide out from the family but they always knew where to find me for dinner and things like that. But I was up in that tree. I used to climb trees a lot. We had the dogwood in the yard that was the harbinger of spring. You know, when they talk about, you know, seasonality, it was like, okay, that's blooming. That means it's spring. Spring is here. It's, it's, you know, going to warm up. And then we had the all of the pines, we always cut our own Christmas tree down because uh, my father would just go out in the woods and come drag the tree back. And we had the holly, which is very like important and significant to me that it just has appeared in my life recurrently. So yeah. Tell us about the holly because that that is a really powerful tree. It is. Well, I feel so emotional when I talk about these different subjects, you know, from the very beginning of our conversation, and we haven't even been talking very long, but, you know, we talked about sort of coming into your own, coming full circle, and, you know, I don't know, I just feel like that tree, the the holly, is just like, kind of me, <laughs> because it's like, it's prickly. It will, it will hurt you if you don't touch it in the right way, if you don't come correct to it. And yet it's just very embracing. It comes winter, it cheers it up because it's like, well, you know, it can be very bleak with all of the naked skeletal trees to me, but then there are the berries, the red berries. So it's like perfect contrast in art, complementary contrast of the red and green they're they're just really magical and I've been very frustrated actually in the Chicago area they don't grow as majestically you know you people have them more as bushes here but it's really a lot of my favorite um trees and um plants don't grow well here so I had to make some adjustments I don't you don't see a lot of dogwoods here you don't see a lot of laurel so things like that so 
my I think I convinced my son he has a new very large property where I live and he has some holly bushes so and that's bushes awesome. aren't the same as trees you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah 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 those American hollies are when they're big they're so majestic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's it's so interesting now, like living sort of like or like in an urban suburb, I would call it. And you have to purchase things that were just so like found and like I feel like they were more heartfelt before, you know, like yeah. willow, willow um twigs. We brought some of those in for Christmas this year and you know, the swags of different kinds of coniferous trees and things like that, you know, it's all you know, and then you have to wonder, you know, do I have the budget for this? Like, can I actually afford my favorite um, greenery to be around me? Mm. Um, that part's a little bit sad when it comes to um, trees in a somewhat urban environment. But if you came through my yard in the summer, it's like, it's like mm -hmm. it's like that old home that I talk about, Paradise Lakes, where I'm from in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. It's so green um, and lush. Mm -hmm. It's gone through different um, iterations. I remember at one point, a um, delivery man. I went outside and I knew I was expecting some things, and he was like a little bit of an older guy, and he was like, "I'm not coming in there because it looks like Nam." You know, Vietnam yeah wow so like yeah it was a lot Jungle, yeah um, my husband says my style of gardening is like throwing a seed bomb <laughs> and then this <laughs> goes up so he's British and he has brought in his like structure like we have uh -huh. we have like boxes now for uh -huh. my wildness to spring out from but it's like not so like how it was at one point where it got really a little carried away. I called it a healer statch, but I don't know what the neighbors thought. Um, That's a good compromise, I guess. Have some yeah. boxes for the wildness. Yeah. yeah. What a good combination too, like the very kind of strict English yeah. garden style with the wild gardening. Yes. I, I, I feel tension in myself in gardening between those two. I yeah. tend towards the wild. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it's also nice to have things ordered somewhat too. Yeah, so you can see them and enjoy them more because yeah. um, here, like my soil is like black. It's like really fertile. So nice. things when the, all of the rain comes and everything, things really take off. So that's good. Yeah, but even our juniper in the back died. I think we had also a cherry tree and that died because I don't know, it just the shade of the buildings and things like that, like didn't agree with them. And they were confined to like a grow box kind of area. That's what the previous owners had done. So yeah, I'm looking out right now and there's like a dead tree of unknown origin. I don't know what that tree is. It looks like oak and maple. I don't know what it is, but anyway, it is all of the leaves are still on it and it's brown. Oh, that's just brown. A, oak oak does that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I know oak pretty well though. It's yeah. not oak. I don't know what it is, but mm -hmm. anyway, I'm having you could see I'm having a little bit of a tree. Yeah. Right now I need to go. Yeah. We have plate like right directly in front of me is a silver birch, which is nice. Um yeah. that is a pretty splendid tree. But yeah, there's something, you know, to me they're almost like people, you know, yeah. they're like, you know, how's the birch doing today? You know, yeah, what's totally. going on? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, trees are like people. I mean, I think this comparison has been made over in mythology a lot, too. You know, like in the Norse mythology, people are made from trees. Right. Yeah. And the Orishas live in trees or like or right. they'll, they'll go, people will go and worship the Orishas at certain trees. Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're all it's a lot of specificity to worship and deity and Orisha. So mm -hmm. I, love that. I love that too. Mm -hmm. And then it was kind of messed up with in America with the hangings, you know, yeah. people from the trees, you know, yes. there became fear around the forest and around 
trees that I tried to, I addressed that a bit in my preface story Mm -hmm. when I went to Tennessee recently. And I noticed the fear in the car, you know, just going, going, driving through the woods. And there were lots of questions because there were a lot of younger women. It's a women's retreat for black and brown women. And I could feel it Mm -hmm. in there outside of me, but also when I saw people in there, I became fearful as well for us because I Mm -hmm. thought that we were very vulnerable and I didn't know what was going to happen, you know, whose land it actually was. And there's a lot of like ownership around land and Mm -hmm. sort of out of European kind of thinking, you know, so I just didn't know, but everything was peaceful and fine. But yeah, there's, there is so much depth to it that, you know, that's why I felt like it lended itself to a book because there is the psychological, the physical, the spiritual, the medicinal, there's, there's so much going on. Yeah, it is really, like, really sad that, you know, for a culture that is so in love, like loves trees so much and came from such a, like a rich history of, you know, this tree adoration and relationship to like now have that fear. And I'm glad that you're bringing light to it and, and offering like all of this research and wisdom and attention to the different trees. And yeah, it's just, it's such a amazing work and I've I've been really enjoying reading it and I can tell that you've put in so much time and energy and research into each tree and the different cultures and communities that you highlight in it as well. Yes. Yeah. Is there, Okay. I was just wondering if there is, if there was any particular tree that when you're researching, you were just like so intrigued and you like followed the threads and and you know is there anything that you learned about a particular tree that stands out yeah I it's it's like when you asked that question I was like oh oh no tamarind no yeah um, that one <laughs> I, yeah, um, yeah a lot of different thoughts were firing through my mind you know I'm interested in how spirits sort of like naughty and negative spirits kind of can inham- inhabit a tamarind tree and yet it gives off this like very interesting pods that we suck from you know and, and get juice and um make sauces and things like mm-hmm. that with. but it's bittersweet just like what i was talking about you know yeah. there's, there's a bittersweetness to that one so i like it a lot we have found a source where we can buy buy it. The, our bird, who's African, enjoys it, and mm-hmm. um, I like I like them too. So yeah, tamarind's interesting. But you know, I was dropping some trees earlier, dogwood and pine trees. All of the coniferous trees have always, since I started researching, particularly like first, like so the pine barrens, the people yeah. from there are called pineys. And then I started thinking about my grandfather who lived with us, who was like, he was born in 1890, so a really long time ago. So I was observant of what he was doing with pine. And I kind of talk about that in my work as well, like where he, you know, liked pine tar soap and pine shampoo for dandruff. And we like using turpentine as a curative, which also comes from pine. So, you know, I, I followed that thread and found out that it's pretty much important in African cem- African American cemeteries and in our medicine ways. And I wrote a, a piece about that for Herb Companion years and years ago called the African American Toolkit or something mm-hmm. like that, like Herbal Toolkit. Mm-hmm. And it was centered around coniferous trees and pines in particular. So. Yeah, pines are such a fantastic group of trees with yeah. like the tar, the pitch, the, yeah. and then the vitamin C and the medicine, and they're evergreens. They're like in yes. the nature. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. also imagine like in New Jersey and in the, in the Pine Barrens and all through the South, like when you go in, in, this, in the South through North Carolina, Georgia, it's all yeah. pines. <laughs> yes, it is. And for some reason, like spirit draws me a lot to Tennessee. So mm. I had um, done when Six Stones, Boots and Bones, my first book came out, I was invited there. Um, my editor 
um, of that book is from Tennessee. Um, she's um, their um, Appalachian people from that area. And so I went to Appalachia. I went to the Smokies with them and did a retreat and just felt so at home spiritually and environmentally with that because you said like what it looks like the the pine trees the evergreen trees are are there and it's kind of like it's not a real dense forest it's not like real large like you would imagine like in Washington state or Oregon it's very it has a lot of intimacy to it and a lot of space and I enjoy that being able to maneuver through there and shower outside be naked mm -hmm. like all yes. that good stuff it's yeah best. <laughs> yeah, we have where we are right now in central New York, the main the main two evergreen trees we have are white pine, which yes. is beautiful, big. I have yeah, I had those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then hemlock, which doesn't have as much of the essential oils as other but other trees. But when you walk through a hemlock grove, yes, creeks, it's just so open. Like mm -hmm. they shade out everything and then they have the soft needles on the floor and you can just walk oh. through there unimpeded and it's just it's so beautiful and the feeling that it evokes mm. with these giant ancient hemlock trees. It's just, it's so, so unique. <laughs> yeah. It sounds really special. Yeah. When I was, so I was in the, what area is that? It's not, I did Nashville more recently, but at that time, what's the other larger city there? Nashville and Knox, Knoxville. Knox Knoxville. So I was in the Knoxville area, but like I said, we, we drove up to, to the mountainous areas and everything in nature seemed so artful in the forest. I thought, do mm. these people like go around? And I knew they didn't, but it looked like <laughs> some being had arranged the, the mm. leaves and the fallen branches, even like everything. It seemed like a work of art to me. Mm. So, Plant yeah. Davis. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Poor, poor they were there. busy. They were busy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were very busy there. So, yeah, it's been interesting. I have a invitation to go to a hoodoo um, festival that I am considering, but there are other larger issues. But anyway, she said, your readers will be there. And we love Stick Stones, Roots and Bones, you know, the first book. And they're doing a ring shout. And I write about the ring shout. And my works in African American, the healing power of African American spirituality. Probably I get them all like they, they kind of come together for me. But anyway, I, I've written about ring shouts. And are you familiar with those? Uh, please tell tell us and our listeners more about them. Yeah. yeah. So it it is what when the enslaved people are uh, religion and spirituality was outlawed. Like it was like in the South, like it was like if you were caught practicing, you would meet with very dire consequences. But on, I think it was on Sundays, I'm not sure exactly what particular day it was, but people would go out in nature in the trees, in the forest, in the thick of the forest, mm -hmm. and just like form circles, like a ring, and do like the spirit shout and clapping mm -hmm. and that and when I saw that they were going to do that at this hoodoo festival I was like so moved and touched to see it like coming back again you know it's like yeah. because it's one of the points that I try to make with my readers is like how strong the na natural connection has been and how it can't that spirit can't be broken and so people find a way, they find a way to practice and subvert and even like, I call it going under Mary's skirts, like, okay, so this is Mary, but oh, it's not really Mary, it's this mm -hmm. is a Marisha, but it's a Siamaya or whomever. So yeah, we find a way. Yeah. Practice our spirituality and be close, close to nature. Not everybody, but increasingly larger and larger amounts. And this is really taking off with the youth which is very mm. um, heartening to me to see mm. because I think people my age you know we kind of like came a bit like after the hippies so that influence was like all in me you know I'm still like a vegetarian and 
I wear my Birkenstocks and, you know, all that good stuff. And, you know, like I said, I'll go sky clad, which if you don't know, means being nude in nature and doing rituals in that, in that manner. So I'm pretty free spirited. But then there was a time before me and the hippies and so forth, black power movement. And after where people like really tightened up and they're like, okay, we don't want to be noticed too much. Like we don't want to make waves. We want to be accepted. We want to assimilate. And now people are coming back to nature and nature worship, African. They're really happy to find sources for reading and learning and practicing in these festivals, the, the spirituality. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, we we're talking with Dr. Faith Mitchell about this too, mm -hmm. because she was one of she was learning from the Gula Geechee elders. Yes, time when most of the people her age had gone off to the city or gone somewhere else. Right, so there was a there was kind of a missing connection in the in the lineage, you know, in in the tradition of, yeah. of knowledge, um, yes. and there were uh, those generations through gen like maybe the generation X, like that kind of. It, there is a, a a movement away from the old fashioned traditions, like the rural yeah. traditions. They were they're all old fashioned, and the, yes. there was this globalization trend. Yes. Um, I feel like now people are getting the the youth are are getting very interested in their the heritage. You know, the heritage is whether yeah. it's hoodoo or Italian American folk magic or Appalachian folk magic. People are really getting. And and so people like you and Faith and others are have been like that that link mm -hmm. in the chain, so, like bring bring the the knowledge and the wisdom through. I'm yeah. really deeply honored to hear that, and I have felt it and seen it. You know, my I have seen it in my book sales of like just like my first mm -hmm. book, Six Stones, Roots and Bones. It was like very sleepy and very like you know it was enjoyed in its little circles for um, a long, long time. And then all of a sudden one year, um, it was like, what? <laughs> like, what happened with these sales figures? And it was like, I call them the naturalistas, mm. you know, like yeah. it's them, you know, they, yes. they have, they have discovered the work and they are, and it, and it has, it's just been like, renewed like I said like some of the books had fallen into being out of print and then Wiser came along and they reprinted it they redid this book yeah uh, African-American magic book prior to that and then prior to that the healing power of African-American spirituality all of them have been um sort of updated and repackaged and brought back to um, people and they this is the time for them and mm -hmm. before in the early 2000s it wasn't yeah so, yeah it's interesting how things go in cycles yes you know mm -hmm. as well but i don't think it's a fad i think you know i can see the sincerity and hear it in their voices like when people write to me hmm. and i have all kind of people writing to me like i remember someone in greece wanted four seasons of mojo went out of print hmm. they were like i need this book like, where can I get this book? <laughs> I don't know. I'm seeing it online for $300. I don't know where you can get it. Wow. You know, I had that case. I had someone write from who was incarcerated. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. They're just vibing the same way yep. everybody else mm -hmm. does who writes to me. And I thought, wow, this is really beautiful. Like such a wide spanning different kinds of audiences. Get really cool notifications from the caribbean mm -hmm. um and yeah it's very meaningful to me and very touching that because you know when i grew up so i mentioned earlier where the first place i had lived where i was born i was born in montclair new jersey and um so a lot of my relatives some of them were from like washington dc baltimore area um new york bronx in North Jersey and so when they would come to visit us they would be like scared a little bit frightened like I'm not staying here after dark the sundown town issue came up and I don't know and being country rural like you said but black people just call it country is a bad word 
so, but I think it's changing. And I think that's really beautiful that it's not, I don't think people are exactly embracing country per se, but the country notion, the notion of being close to the land and out in open spaces definitely is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there's that, the, the biophilia, the, the love of nature, yes. which is easy to get into when you're around trees all the time and in the, in the forest, in the, in the, the prairie right um, out in nature yeah see but there it is kind of it can be also scary just in terms of if you're used to everything being structured by thought and by human like buildings around you everywhere sidewalks it can be very disorienting to be in, in a very natural uh, environment as well yeah one of the things that i talk about in my book is about growing your own like growing I'm growing, I have a lemon tree in my dining room and I got inspired. One of my neighbors, she has, she has passed away, but I went to her house and she had a, some sort of orange tree. Not, it's in that family of citrus and it went all the way to the ceiling. And I thought, what the wow. heck? <laughs> you know, as I've said, we're surrounded by sidewalks. You know, there's a train, you know, there's buses down the street and things like that. But like this woman had a, orange tree up to our ceiling so I thought well I'm going to grow Meyer lemons and over the years I have tried and tried different locations in my home and I finally found the right one where it's flourishing in the summer I bring it outside and now it is at least four and a half feet tall you know it started like this little tiny thing I also have a money tree my money tree is happening you know you asked me one of my favorite nice. trees I'm like oh this tree provides nice. prosperity and abundance and beauty. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's a splendid and happy tree. So I keep it at the in the dining room where we have our family dinners along with the Meyer lemon. But yeah, I wanted to and you know kind of inspire people who live in more confined environments that yes, you can even grow these things in your home. You can grow banana tree, you can grow all kind of palm things like that and, yeah you know you talk about in your book uh, how to propagate pineapples yes 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 mm -hmm. and oh my daughter and she just like drove up here it's gonna make my dog go nuts but <laughs> she's a great propagator mm. oh my gosh she is so like into plants right now she has like hundreds of them she goes to these we have these big like plant sales here like chicago plant parties mm -hmm. and she goes there and gets her different kinds of yeah. plants and but she also will just stick things in the ground mm -hmm. and grow them mm -hmm. yeah wow. cool good for her. she lives in the city proper she mm -hmm. lives like right in the the real nitty-gritty yeah yeah you and can do it you can do it anywhere yeah absolutely yeah, a balcony you can do <laughs> stuff so you mentioned uh bananas and you can yes. grow this inside. And bananas are such a wonderful plant, uh, a staple in many parts of the world in the tropics. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about bananas and their importance? Even for semi-food deserts, like bananas are always there. The bananas are something that you can typically get in herbal environments, rural environments, all times of the year. I have been captivated by banana for a long time. You know, one of the prominent works that I did as an artist is called Banana God. And so I I rendered a banana. It's about, I don't know, 50 inches tall or so and 36 inches wide. So a pretty large piece. Yeah, and that's... it is a close up of, of a bunch of bananas, but the, the connector fibers on them, the face forms like an orisha like so and they displayed that in continent benin africa in the embassy here years ago but yeah i so i told a story in in my book about how a child nameless child in certain parts of africa are laid on a banana leaf and then it can become a person and be named but first has to have a contact with that leaf and i just I think that's so beautiful. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much like my people that I have tracked my mother's lineage back to are the pygmy people. Oh. And they have so much to do um, with bananas and banana leaf cooking. 
like we hear about that in parts of South and Central America, but in the Congo, they do that as well. They wrap like fish and rice into in the leaf and then cook it in hot ash. So yeah, bananas are just really important, like nutritionally, like I said, availability, spiritually, they're a powerful, powerful tree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, you said in the book how one of the, one of the magical uses is collecting the the stems of the leaves and drying them and then using them in divination as well. Yes, yes, mm-hmm. that's really cool, really interesting. Yeah. I like I like how with a lot of people, indigenous people, including indigenous African people, because sometimes people forget that we are indigenous as well. But we'll use every different part, like from the bud, to the seed, to the leaf, the roots, the bark with the tree. Every little part has a role to play. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me also of like using plant stems in divination, like is is a a thing that you find in the world. Like in China, you know, they use the arrow stalks for the Mm -hmm. eating. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. But you're also able to, like, it's such a a powerhouse of a food plant, too. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that's what I go, I go into more detail about that in Motherland Herbal. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, like, have a, a pretty um, chunky section just on banana, its uses and nutrition. And I'm that book is sort of more holistic medicine. So it's less of the sort of green witchery and more of the sort of medicinal qualities of these different herbs and trees and so forth. So, yeah, I love plantain too. Yeah, plantain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. We, I, I was, I did a retreat and there was a, a Dominican mother and daughter there and they showed me how to cook green plantain, like potatoes. Yeah. They yes. eat it. And I was like, I still prefer the like almost totally black plantain fried in butter. Yeah. <laughs> so much sweeter. But as like yeah. a potato dish, that's actually that's not too bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. My son in law is Puerto Rican and yeah, we shows us like different ways of um cooking them that I like you said, like the green and the mashed and different things like that. So it's nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're very, very hearty and very nutritious fruits. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And then I'm, I was more familiar with more of the, the temperate plants in here, the ones that grow around here, like the black cherry, which is a fantastic medicinal plant. Yeah. Oak and the holly and, and, and the pines. You have so many tropical plants in here, tropical trees. And last last year in January, we were able to go down to South Florida and meet some tropical trees, medicinal and, and edible trees in person. And yeah. it's so it's so different seeing like, a star fruit yes. from a tree and then eating it. Mm-hmm. You know, so have you been able to travel in the tropics? Have you met some of these trees in person? I have. Well, like I spent a year in Australia. Wow. Yeah. Most of that was in the outback and the place that we stayed in close to Darwin, Elko Island. It's not that close to Darwin, but people will know the name Darwin more than Elko Island. We had star fruit in in the yard and we were like, we were so broke (laughs) at that point. Like we were eating a lot of star fruit. Yeah. 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 Oh, and they're there. (laughs) Yeah. And and it's beautiful. And it's like, what? Like we can just like go out and pick this stuff. Like we were Mm -hmm. doing that a lot, like with chicken eggs and tomatoes that were growing outside and basil, just like really living off the land coconut Mm -hmm. yeah yeah coconut is so like useful and good and i i like you grew up like in a temperate zone so there were no coconut trees growing around but there yes like we you know you have to have a good climber sometimes to go up and yeah retrieve the coconut or shake it so that one might luckily fall but i really love coconut that's yeah. why I, I said that even before I went to these places, I was enjoying the coconut, like like shredding it and sauteing it and coconut oil and, and things like that. And yeah, I would question myself, like, where is all of this coming from? But I think if you're like a really magical and spiritual person, 
there's no need to really question just be be comfortable with it because mm -hmm. there is a sole reason why it's not like you're copying something or being inauthentic mm -hmm. it comes from somewhere in your spiritual lineage or even your um dna ancestry so Mm, follow that resonance yeah i think it's also natural for humans to want to explore new things and and try new tastes and, and flavors and yes that too yeah and it's like it's there like again like in chicagoland we have so many like in the markets there's whole like sections of foods from africa and from Me mexico and it's always there the banana banana flowers you know the Ooh. pods the leaves it's all like readily like within like a couple of miles from me where i'm sitting right now i could go and get those and yeah. um, this weekend i was communing with a cacao tree oh so wow like, really that's another one of my neighbors we have, have a, a conservatory down the street Cool. And, uh, yeah they were in all different like some of the pods were yellow some were brown some were orange just all different uh colors i really love that tree mm. I love the, the flower that it puts off I, I love how like things grow on to me like like illogically kind of because like <laughs> the pod will grow like right out of the trunk mm -hmm. of the tree or uh doesn't just hang like how you would expect yeah yeah it's really it's really different so i i like my cacao nibs to mm -hmm. engage with that but i i also just like to draw that i like to draw that pretty tree yeah put near it mm -hmm. and yeah. then it's aura mm -hmm. yeah 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 chocolate is <laughs> i know well, one yeah, of the chocolate. greatest things in the world in my opinion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yeah and you know i was with someone we we're watching a, sort of a documentary and i'm like I hate to go to these dark subjects yeah. so much but i told you i'm a virgo we have these tendencies mm -hmm. but i was like it was about the congo area and i'm like they're going to talk about chocolate slavery i know they are and they did so there's like the beautiful, wonderful, fun parts of cacao and chocolate. And then there's like a little bit of a darker side that I also talk about in my work, you know, because I yeah. want people to make like fair trade and yes. organic. When you buy it that way, it is typically not in those coming from those sources, but if you get like super like cheap chocolate from unknown sources, then it could be from a shady place. So. That's, yeah, really important to think about. Anyway. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think we have to, like, be mindful totally. of how we engage in um, the earth and its um, fruits and um, trees and pods and so forth. It's really important with, like, sandalwood, for example, too. You yeah. Know? yeah. Mm -hmm. Right about that. Yeah. Fr yes. Frankincense even is, is yes. starting to become endangered Thanks. in parts. Yeah. Well, yeah. What were you saying about it? Well, it's it's becoming over harvested in certain areas, and then over the, harvested, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then there we can use pine tree resin in a in a very similar way. Right. You can harvest yourself and in the temperate temperate climates. So there's. Yeah, I think even like coal. Copal, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, is related. They're they're related to the frankincense, myrrh, and pine. Mm. with the botanical name oh, okay yeah so yeah you can definitely like switch up your sources and that's what like the idea of these books and being educated about trees like not just like oh ah but also like being mindful about sourcing and who you're getting it from and where it's coming from and things like that so yeah, and recognizing the the comp the complex history of of all of these trees, like yes. a tree for a black person in America is not just a tree, right? And chocolate can, yeah, these are very important things to to mention and, and talk about. Yeah. yeah, yes, that is really important. Um, also when frankincense and myrrh is something that I will wax on endlessly about <laughs> all of my works, um, because it was like. 
kind of one of the first things that I was introduced to physically were, were frankincense and myrrh incense, like as incense and not the raw way I use it now, where you just kind of grind it up and put it on a, a charcoal, but and, and the punk sticks my mother would have. But now also there are, for lack of a better word, there may be a better word, but I'm just going to say like sort of like war, kind of warlord lords and gangs are controlling their them in commerce some somewhat. So yeah. they only grow in really a, a small swath of the earth. So yeah. Yeah, I, I've I've luckily been able to find some good suppliers of frankincense because yeah. it is there is really nothing exactly like frankincense. No, it's there it's, no. it's a it's a own thing. <laughs> it's but I've I've heard also that it is not too hard to grow in like south the southwest of the U.S. Oh, really? Something I can if, that. yeah, definitely like see that dry, arid, deserty. Yeah, mm-hmm. I try so, to grow different things like. Even like bay, like I, I uh, saw it when I was at yeah. the observatory, a beautiful bay tree. Mine did well during the summer, but of course died back and didn't come back the next season. But you can definitely try growing things, and I really advocate for that. Yeah, for sure. In your home. Bay is such a fantastic, magical, and medicinal mm-hmm. tree. Yeah. yeah. Sure. We I'm, have that in hoodoo. Yeah. yeah. Of the bay, bay leaf. Yeah, yeah, Love it's it, prosperity. Mm. Yeah, it's one of my favorite incense. Yeah, bay leaf. Mm-hmm. Me too. Mm-hmm. Really, that's one of the things ways that I really like engaging with trees is in incense and my potpourri's that I make. Like, Ooh, yeah, I grind up juniper berries in the uh, mortar and pestle, and then use that as the heavy tone but also also grind up bay leaves and have them whole. Um, of course, lemon rinds and orange rinds. And um, it's all about the trees with that incense, you know. Is So that's for the incense, not the potpourri? You're grinding up lemon rind? Uh, both. I do it both. Yeah. For both. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice. Oh, yeah, so my, my potpourris are pretty complex and I do list them out like recipes for them in my different books mm-hmm. six stones roots and bones really has like kiffy and like I think a ocean incense lots of different ones yeah sweet mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you about, about and the significance of the kalabash as well kind of to change the subject into that but I was wondering if you want to tell us like maybe first what a kalabash is and what are the different ways that you can use a kalabash, whether it's through instruments or food or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> it's a whole kalabash thing. Kalabash is it's like a whole big subject that I could talk about for at least an hour. I when you talk about the instruments, I just love the fact that you could have music emanating from a plant like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. This uh pod they I can't think of the names exactly right now but one that looks like a harp and puts off sound like a harp stringed instrument yeah so instruments are made from the food implements especially in early early african-american um, culture like implement like ladles were made from from the bush. you put them you can grow them in your yard like if you grow them around the fence it will like protect like protect your land and bring good spirit and abundance to to you yeah they're just beautiful just to have them like on your mantle on your altar just to to have them they also relate back to specific orisha there's a lot with with calabash Mm -hmm. yeah so it's a kind of gourd yes it is it's also, tiny, but you know gourds are just so like varied from you know this big to like this big so they are varied yeah, yeah. and I've, I've heard that the it's the the big dipper the name for the constellation in the, in the sky that we see that's named after the uh, a dipper gourd yeah con- yes yeah. yes mm-hmm. wow yeah that's so cool mm-hmm. it seems like a very important plant yeah in yes. in african 
culture cultures. It is very important, very, very important. And we should celebrate it and engage it as much as possible. And it's widely available and inexpensive and um, yeah. easy to grow. So that's true. Yeah. There's no excuse not to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a great book. I'm I'm glad you've you've put all the work into it and it's getting a, a, a second wind. Yeah. Um, thank you. Sure. Because trees, trees are just so important to human, human life. And we don't really think about them all that much sometimes. Yes. But they're so important. Mm. And like, I've been, that's, I, I love trees. I, I, I'm always, I, I go through a lot of tree phases where I'm very intensely focused on different trees. <laughs> He gets obsessed. I get okay, yeah. I get obsessed. <laughs> like right now, I'm obsessed with like. There are so many fantastic trees native to the Northeast and to Appalachia yes. that I think are underutilized. You know, yes. but still have like like sassafras has a very rich tradition. Um, the hand, the hand, the leaves are like little hands. You know? yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it, it's you know the the leaves are used in 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 making soups. Mm-hmm. Uh, soup thickener, like thickener. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, all the way down through New Orleans, right? Like a drink too, like oh. yeah, they're like drink the root beer drink. Yeah, so yummy, so good. The, that that's one of my favorite things to make. Isaac makes a natural root beer with sassafras and a really new oh, so nice. And, I'd love and, to see the recipe for that. Yeah, we yeah. can we can send it to you. Post yeah. It. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the small beer, you know, it's like slightly alcoholic. So it can like keep for a little while too, but it's fermented then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. You don't have. I mean, you can do other ways to do it too, uh, but yeah. it's nice to ferment things, let them keep longer. Yeah. Yes, for sure. But and another... people enjoy fermentation, people and animals. Yeah, yeah of course, <laughs> totally. Right. Well, yeah, elephants. <laughs> Even are are are. I've seen wasps and hornets enjoying a fallen apple that rotting yes. <laughs> for yeah. sure. Definitely. <laughs> and deer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But one one of the things I was thinking about too is like because a lot of these there's so many wonderful tropical trees. Uh but but sometimes, you know, it, it takes a lot to you know they're not available all the time. Yeah. People, especially if you live in the country or if you live in the city in a food desert. Um, right. but there are also a lot of like like the like using pine resin instead of frankincense there are a lot of yes. native plants that are that are, can be useful in that way now i've been thinking about like northern bayberry because they yes. have really wonderful leaves like bay yes and using that as a instead of bay uh as well like i that. like that too a lot and i think that like you know i get torn you know, in a lot of my earlier works, there are a lot of what I would call, for lack of a better word, exotic materials and things that are shipped and things like that. And I think it was before I, you know, to be honest, had that epiphany or, you know, it's really a, it's our, all of our shared consciousness that is saying, get it from your neighborhood, grow it yourself. Part of my notion about you know, shea butter, you know, that I write about a lot and coconut oil and these things that are, you know, pretty unlikely unless you live like in Florida or someplace in the United States that you're growing, you can, you couldn't grow a shea tree here. Um, as far as I know, anyway, it's probably someone doing it right now, but in special circumstances, but it wouldn't be easy. Coconut, yes. But where was I going with that? It's just that I was trying to for generate support for the women and children that harvest shea yeah for and sure that, and the different components that come from different parts of africa i was like okay if we can um, support them get it from directly from source then we're going to be helping these grassroots movements and businesses and you know enterprises so that's like a little part of my brain um process but the other part larger is now from home, support your local farmers, grow it yourself, support your local businesses, things like that. So Mm -hmm. yeah, not depend on shipping and things like that so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also see how it's important, especially for like people of African heritage to connect with the the heritage and the the tradition through these, these plants from Africa. Mm -hmm. Yes. Same way. Then connecting with the local bioregion, I think is so Mm -hmm. important as well. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, you know, as time goes on, I'm going to start thinking about, you gave me a very important thought about the substitutes, the local Mm. substitutes for frankincense and myrrh and and things like that. I mean, they're really, you can't imitate them or replace them because of Mm -hmm. their, their spiritual dynamics and their actual um, aromatherapeutic qualities, but you can get something akin to Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You can get it, uh, get their kin over mm-hmm. here. So um, it's yeah. a beautiful concept. I like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, pine resin is not frankincense, but yes. it can be used similarly. And pine has its own things that are, that makes it unique, you know. Yes. And I'm sure there are things that, I mean, sassafras is very unique. There's not yeah. another, you know. Um, yeah. And it's very underutilized. Like you yeah. say, like a long time ago, like in a work like Back to Eden or something like that, or early herbal, they will talk about it. But like in more contemporary works, not so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think part of that is because certain count compounds in, in like the saffron, it, it, like if you concentrate it and inject it into somebody, then you can cause cancer. Uh, yeah. but that's kind of like it, it's taking it way out of context and yeah. Yeah. can be a recreational drug and yeah. Yeah. like the the sass like yeah cooking it down in this particular way so i think it has been like sort of limited in that way of like yeah. it seeming more harmful than it actually is in, in normal use yeah definitely yeah that's kind of i think it's similar to how people don't use comfrey internally anymore, even though it has like officially people don't use it internally anymore, yeah. though it has thousands of years of use mm-hmm. internally. Yeah. yeah because you know, of those studies that mm-hmm. uh, have been taken out of context. <laughs> right. Or yeah, it's just a small sampling and then yeah. they decide to ban it or, you know, they did this whole number on black co- cohosh a number of years ago that oh if you buy those supplements there's really no black cohosh really in it or it has these harmful materials in it and it it really caught our time and i think it's behind big business wanting us to use other more expensive things definitely yeah they they want they need their cut but it also shows the importance of like connecting with your local herbalists and foragers and small farmers yeah, uh, can because getting the making sure of the the source of your medicine is very important. Mm-hmm. It really is, and some people don't have a green thumb. You know, I'm a lot about like growing these things, and you know, some people just aren't into it. They don't have the time for it, or but you can go to a farmer's market. They're like popping up everywhere. We have a really nice one in our community and adjoining communities in the city, so. And I really like, I like the idea that I'm helping a family. Yeah. You know, and I'm helping them keep hold of their land. So I like going to farmer's markets as well. And you really are like, you, you really are helping families when you're going to a farmer's market and supporting the farmer. Yeah. The exchange is so beautiful. You know, you you just, just feels good. Yeah, seeing the person that grew your food or raised the animal or made the craft, you know, the candles or whatever you're buying, like yeah. it's just so Vinegars special. And, yeah, different things. Yep. And then there are less less big business hands taking their cut. Exactly. It's like a direct between. sale, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. I mean, some places you go anyway, even the vegetables are, are wrapped in plastic. Saran wrap. Yeah. I'm yeah. Like, kidding me like yeah stickers on the stuff and taste you know, not taste it but at least smell it and like squeeze it a little bit yeah exactly <laughs> right for you for your purpose exactly um, but you know one of the things that you were making me think of is Isaac with shea butter I I do like provide like ritual and like just like experience that I've had just with shea butter and how, like actual like really short like five minute ritual that you can do with it in your hands how that like lends itself to prayer prayerfulness and when you smell it like you can smell the fires that it was roasted on to be mm-hmm. like you can mm-hmm. actually smell it and imagine the the women's hands that were working yeah. it because you know like in africa 
most of the farmers are women, sub-Saharan Africa. So, mm -hmm. uh, and the children are there helping as well. So I really, I like that quality of, of shea butter. It's an amazing, amazing tree and substance. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had a, a braider. She is from um, Northwest Africa. And she was just talking about shea and telling me, I was like, did you read my book? But no, she had not. I didn't say that, but I was just thinking it because it was like all the qualities like over and over, like, yeah, we use them for light. We use them just so many purposes, you know, for cuts, for our hair, for sunburn, on and on and on. So they have a lot of medicinal qualities to that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah love the smell of it like when you were talking about it, i was just imagining the smell yes. and i'm like oh it's so, mm -hmm. so good and then they also like for people that need a certain aroma that they want for their soap they also will denature it and take the scent out for people mm. that you know really need it just purely smell like lavender or right. lemongrass or something like mm -hmm. that so there are different kinds and colors of it yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, this has been a wonderful discussion, Stephanie. Thank you for being on the show again. Yeah. Yeah. Before we wrap up, do you want to tell us how people can get a hold of your books and, and your apprenticeship and and you and what get get abreast of what you're doing in your life? Yeah. So there's the best way is on um, Instagram. And my Instagram handle is S period R period bird, B-I-R-D. And then Facebook, I have a professional page with my name, Stephanie Rosebird. And the, my Instagram and Facebook are connected though. So you just go to Instagram and follow me. Then it will also reflect back to Facebook. And then I have a website, www.stephanieroseberg.com. And I, I post between those sources, you will find out more. But I would say, so June 11th of this year, my big book, my magnum opus, so to speak, is coming out. It's called Motherland Herbal, and it's from Harper Collins, Harper One publisher. And then I have this wonderful apprenticeship that I mentioned a little bit earlier called Earthwise Spirituality. We haven't really, our website isn't fully developed yet. My son is our website developer, and he's on it. It's going to be beautiful, but just remember that name, Earthwise Spirituality, and we will be coming out with fantastic classes in February of 2025, but we're going to start enrolling people well before then, so keep your eyes peeled. Is that awesome. going to be an online offering or in person? Yeah. Uh, it's online, online and in person. Ooh. Because I'm, I'm going to travel to some different states and... Mm -hmm. um people are going to be invited to come and uh, meet with me and, and do some work. That's and amazing. Um, yeah. Oh my I'm gosh. So I'm so excited. excited. It. Yeah, it's really that's, exciting. That's so awesome. So, but the, the book that I have out right now, because I'm, I'm very fortunate to have all of these different books, yeah. my tree book, the healing tree. So that is available now, and it's a nice, thick compendium about trees from an African-American perspective. So tuck cool. in, enjoy. Yes. Thank you so much for having me again. I remember doing the show, the episode 19 that you mentioned. So it's nice to see you all again. Nice to, yeah. to see you. Yeah. Great to see you as well. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Bye.